you see a chat box. It looks like a little comic dialog box. So you can click on that to see my email. Um, and you can also type in the chat if you have any trouble. But if you get knocked off or something, you can send me an email. Julie is all set with the wine. Say hi. <laughs> All right, it's about 4.05, do, should we get started? Sure. I'm going to do a little intro anyway. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I am Emily. I am normally the adult librarian at the Studio City branch of the Los Angeles Public Library System. And we thank you so much for joining us today for our Documenting Disaster, the Perils of Truth and Information panel. But before we get started, uh, I just wanted to remind everyone to explore the digital authorings of the Los Angeles Public Library System on LAPL.org. You can see my lovely backwards card here. Um, if you live in Los Angeles County and did not have a library card, you can actually get a digital card right away by visiting the website. Uh, so you can check out the website for in details on that and also a full list of events taking place online. Again, we're LAPL.org. For those of you not from Los Angeles, your public libraries probably have a, a lot of the same resources. So I encourage you to, to check them out as well. So we are lucky to have us, with us today, Katya Sengel, author of Forward Indies 2020 finalist from Chernobyl with Love, reporting from the ruins of the Soviet Union. Uh, Sengel's book is available on Hoopla Digital with your Los, Los Angeles Public Library card. And again, if you have any trouble with digital resources, please contact one of your librarians. We are all happy to help you out. So that's available on Hoopla Digital. And joining Sengel on the panel will be Jin Ding, International Women's Media Foundation Program Manager and co-founder of Chinese Storytellers, and Courtney Raj, the Advocacy Director for the Committee to Protect Journalists. Shilpa Jindia, a freelance journalist and IWMF fellow, will be moderating the panel. And with that, I would like to turn this over to them. So thank you all for being here today. Great. Uh, well, thanks everyone for joining us and thanks to the LA Public Library for hosting and organizing this. Uh, so this panel is a modified version of a book talk that Katya and I did at uh, Loyalty Books in Washington DC back in January, which feels like many years ago now. Um, and that was in partnership with the Committee to Protect Journalists and the International Women's Media Foundation. And at the time, there was a lot of interest in Katya's memoir about reporting from Ukraine and Chernobyl from, I believe, 1998 to 2002 um, with, uh, with the HBO show that was on last year. And with COVID-19, there's even more reason to return to her experiences telling stories about the disaster and its, and its fallout. And then we wanted to widen this, uh, the discussion by bringing in Jin and Courtney to discuss some of the challenges that journalists are facing in reporting on the pandemic. Uh, disasters, as we know, become crises of legitimacy for governments and emergencies become opportunities for them to exert power and control. And for many governments, the priority is to save face and citizens are then left to survive on their own. And with the understandable preoccupation with coronaviruses, uh, with coronavirus, many governments are already taking advantage of this moment to extend uh, their repressive hand. So journalists, therefore, aren't just documenting the truth, but they're also keeping those governments in check, putting themselves at risk. This is normally the case for too many journalists around the world at any given moment, unfortunately, but the pandemic has its particularities. So we'll start with Katya to hear a bit about her experience reporting from Chernobyl before talking to Jin about how Chernobyl is actually a household name in China, while the government still relies on censorship to get through crises like pandemics and you know, other public disasters. Um, and then Courtney will discuss the risks for journalists reporting on COVID in the Middle East and um, around the world, as well as how journalists are overcoming these barriers. So we'll take about 30 to 40 minutes to do that. And you can leave questions in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end. So Katya, uh, tell us a bit about your experience chronicling stories um, from the residents of Chernobyl when you lived in Ukraine. Yeah, thanks. And first I wanted to thank you for doing this and for all you guys for being here. And it was, as uh, Shilpa was saying, we were in DC before and it was then that Jin had actually mentioned about no, it was a couple 
weeks or mo a month later, COVID happened, COVID-19 engine mentioned, and then I was like, oh, wow, this is part of a bigger thing. So it's really been interesting. When I was there, the first time I went, I believe it was 1999. And then the next time was, I went several times because um, I was based in Kiev, uh, capital of Ukraine at the time. And so I made several trips. And the first one was I had heard about that there were people who had gone back to live. There's an exclusion zone around Chernobyl where um, no one is supposed to live. And there were some scientists doing experiments there, but no one was officially living there. And I had heard mostly maybe a couple hundred at most elderly residents, former residents had gone back to live there. And at the time, not a, now you hear these stories a lot, but at the time you didn't hear a lot about it. Um, and so I, I wanted to go back and see that. And I remember the photographer I was working with, I was working in a freelance for US publications, but I was also working for um, a Kiev, English language newspaper there, Kiev Post, which still exists and still there. And the photographer who was Ukrainian, I remember I was friends with his girlfriend. She, she asked me many times not to take him with me. She really didn't want him to go. She was that scared. She was Ukrainian as well, had grown up there. And she said, please don't take Victor. And I said, well, if he's willing to go, you know, I wanna go. And so it was still, kind of a place people didn't go um, and we had to get special permission and everything like that and there weren't a lot of people there and it was very hard to find the residents because you go in um, it's an abandoned village and then you'll see uh, trees growing up in front of doorways and you'll see no street signs so you can't really find a street there are no street signs there's nothing there just um, a lot of overgrown in wilderness and then you'll see one house with laundry outside drying and realize, okay, there are people there. And so we're, those were some of the people I spoke to at that time. And uh, so what were residents telling you when you were talking to them uh, about their experiences, but then also how Chernobyl was being portrayed to the outside world, sort of what the, the narrative and the story was around the disaster? Yeah, it was interesting because I think this will get to some of what Jen and Courtney will start talking about too, is the older residents, it was mostly older people had gone back in and all of them would say, well, we're old, we don't care, we can get cancer, whatever, but also because there had been so much secrecy about Chernobyl originally and things, I don't think they ever really believed anything that came out after. Um, so there was a, a sense of, well, yeah, people say it's unsafe, but what do they know before people said it was nothing, you know? So there was just kind of this um, more willing to take that risk because there was lack of trust in any of the information that came out because once you've been lied to and, and people haven't told you the truth and then you don't know what is the truth or what to the, that. And I think um, a lot of them the, the, the older people there, they, they had this different memory for them. Chernobyl was a beautiful place, really nice countryside and great vegetables and those things. And yes, yeah, so there was this disaster, but um, they wanted to go back. That was home. And I think though also there was a lot of, I'm not sure how, how much they believed or they knew what to believe on that. So there was still lots of different, and at the time outside, this, you know, you had people like Jenya who my friend who was the girlfriend of the photographer who did not want him going anywhere near there. And then you had people like those older residents who were just like, whatever. So again, like now you kind of have some people who are wearing face masks and taking things very seriously. And some people are like, they go out and just like normal. So you, there was that wide variety still, I think. Hmm. And did they talk about how the Soviet government had handled the entire crisis? You know, it's interesting, not as much, um, I think partly because it was still, we're talking, what, it was still too recent almost, there was still, when I first came to Ukraine, it was still a lot of repression and still a lot of fear, and especially the older generation, they weren't going to talk about certain things, and they weren't going to talk, um, even as a journalist, I had a lot of trouble getting people to talk in the older generation, just fear. Uh, the younger generation was different and they would talk and I think there was more um, speaking up about what the government had done. But this was a time, this is before the Orange Revolution in Ukraine and um, before uh, what led to that, 
actually right, the, the last reactor at Chernobyl was shut down in 2000. And that when it was going on, the president, Kuchma of Ukraine was um, accused of being implicated in beheading a journalist who had spoken out against him. So there's still a lot um, at stake for criticizing, even if it was a past government, that government was kind of um, sympathetic with the current, this current government was kind of sympathetic. So it was, it wasn't as easy to talk about it as it would be here. Right. So by the time you visited, this was about 15 years on from the disaster and almost 10 since the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Yeah. And so this week we're actually approaching the 34th anniversary of Chernobyl. Um, so I imagine you've been reading a lot of the coverage and I think there's events that are, you know, other events that are certainly being organized around this. So the way that people are talking about Chernobyl, how you know, how is that ringing to you? And then how does it, um, you know, how has it changed since your time there? Yeah, well, it's weird for me because um, there was quite a few articles recently about people going and now they're actually official tourist organizations leading journalists there and they describe like the tourist organization and fixers find them the people to interview and it, it's become, I think some, there was one picture in the Wall Street Journal had like a Ferris wheel in the background or something. I mean, it's become totally different from what it was when I was there. It was, it was pretty difficult still to go there when I was there. Not many journalists went, not many people wanted to go. Um, and now it's almost like adventure tourism kind of place, you know, where you can say, oh, I went. It, it's weird how it, it keeps this uh, fascination with people, I think, because there aren't that many places like that where you can kind of just see time stood still. I remember I went in the house. I, I in a way, um, because there weren't official tours, the first time I went, I went with a former resident. Um, and so he had permission to go into the area. And we went to his house. And I remember the calendar was April 1986. And on the ground there were um, family photos, and there was one he didn't actually have a copy of. And he he was looking at it and wanting to take it. And I said, oh, you should take it. And he said, no, the dust. Um, so he wouldn't take it. So it was, I guess, I don't want to say more intimate, but I was able to, it wasn't a tourist direction then. So it wasn't like a tour guide. It was a real person who had a, a story about being there. And he hadn't been kind of, you know, in journalism, how it is when you talk to people who are used to having a tour or whatever, it's different than if you're one of the few journalists there and you're seeing it, I think. And I'm curious, what was your perception of Chernobyl going into it and as well of the Soviet government and how they had handled the disaster and some of the censorship around it? Yeah, I think because I was I was young, but I was a, I was a kid when Chernobyl happened. And so I don't remember hearing I was very pretty young kid, so I don't remember much then. But by the time I was a little older, young adult, I remember kind of hearing more about it and hearing it from the US here about um, how it had been covered up and how it was the BBC, I think it was the BBC that is how, well, actually Anatoly, Anatoly told me in Kiev how he heard about it. His sister and um, dad were back in Chernobyl, um, was from BBC, which he had got he wasn't supposed to be listening to, but he had gotten that and how the local um, media wasn't covering it. And it was because the cloud, the radiation uh, went other places in Europe that it got back and Ukraine had to finally kind of acknowledge it. And so that was my perception of kind of how the government had put their reputation above that of the people and um, had sacrificed their, the, the people and happened again later with other things, but Chernobyl was kind of, I think, one of those things that brought the world's attention to just how much um, the government there was willing to um, sacrifice its own people. And, and it, I think it did start, you'll, in the HBO miniseries, you kind of see how it set the stage for, for the collapse years later. A lot of people are, argue it wasn't that much longer. And so it was one of those things that really uh, let the world know a little more how things were going there. Right. Well, so um, Jin, as, as Katya was saying, after the, the talk in January, I think you were telling us a little bit about how Chinese students learned quite a bit about Chernobyl, as opposed to here in the States, where I think until the miniseries last year, you know, Chernobyl was somewhat forgotten or just kind of relegated as a like a fascinating artifact. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about how students learn about China and how China has 
you know, what can be a very close ally to, to Russia at times, um, how they sort of absorb the lessons of Chernobyl. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think uh, uh, one thing very different with here is Chernobyl is in the textbook in China, which means you learn it um, from middle school to high school in like geography, chemistry, um, physics class, um, depending on what they're teaching. Um, but the difference is like in compare with people who know Chernobyl in the US probably have learned the uh, the government restrictions and how that led into a, a disaster locally. Um, uh, to its people in China, that part has been missing. So most of the people they learn are Chernobyl has been like this nuclear accident, and then like this happened to um, not only um, Soviet Union but the surrounding countries and areas that all been impacted by it. But um, instead, there is no information of how the government has went into this like censoring period and how that information not being shared with the public had led to um, a bigger disaster that it should have been. Um, I think that really just uh, shows like um, how um, history are being taught in China, especially um, like recent history that has, um, you know, Soviet Union had a very uh, specific tie with the Chinese government at the time um, and throughout the years. And it, it's always um, being in that way that when we talk about Soviet Union, it's, it's kind of having a glaze or having a special lens when you discuss the history of Soviet Union. And that really um, plays into how people learn about Chernobyl in China, um, which is a critical part of the information has been never shared um, with the public. When you say the critical um, piece of information that hasn't been shared with the public, you mean? Yeah, it means like the, the Soviet government has decided to cover it um, at that moment. And that's never um, being part of the, um, like textbook in China, when we learn about Chernobyl, we only learn, learn about the accident and, and we learn about the outcome, which is like horrific. Um, but the, the in between, there is no in between um, his, the story being taught. Do you know anything about how um, the Chinese government itself might have learned lessons about how to control the public or how to control information from Chernobyl itself? Or I don't, I don't um, have like a, I don't have a, like a specific, obviously, evidence or anything that to say that how the Chinese government learned from Chernobyl. But what I can say is definitely they have learned this throughout years of information controlling um, from, you know, um, back to the days, which also happened in uh, 1989, the Tiananmen Square, and then which is literally completely removed from our history book and anywhere information public being shared. Um, I personally didn't know about it until I went to college um, of Tiananmen Square, which is like kind of mind blowing for a lot of people when I think about people living in China in my age, um, born um, around that time, um, would never learn about it until almost 20 years later. Um, and then at the same time, you know, uh, throughout the years, they they using this different kind of method with internet controlling with now like there is a famous great wall <laughs> around us um, in China, the firewall basically block all the information that we needed to learn um, from foreign sites um, or like a, a website that are um, sharing information that the government doesn't want you to know. know. And then further within the firewall, you see social media censoring um, and uh, tight control on the um, newspapers, outlets um, that supposedly have could have done a better job on monitoring the government and uh, and knowing uh, inform the public of what they should be doing. But that part of information um, they've learned throughout the years how to control that, um, and they're getting better and better on that as well. Mm -hmm. And you were saying that some of the restrictions around information and reporting were loosened during the peak of the epidemic. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about that and how Chinese journalists were able to use that to their advantage or at least how they responded to that window? Yeah, it's a very interesting because now looking back um, of the COVID-19 history in China, which is still happening right now, um, like we can see the key data points going back to um, early December. Um, but basically between December to mid of January, this um, entire like six weeks, seven weeks, the information have been never shared with the public um, for various of reasons. And literally um, 
for that six to seven weeks, the local media has been, you know, um, not speaking up at all, even speaking against the um, doctors who and nurses who have been trying to warn the public. But then as soon as the government has decided this is an uncontrollable situation that we have to lock down Wuhan, um, that moment created a huge panic, I would say, in the local community and inside of China, because the lockdown happened basically at the same time when Chinese New Year starts, which is a time that people gathering together, like eating together, and the government basically tell, tell, are tell, telling people don't do any of that. So with that, um, like kind of the public health urgency that they wanted to make sure people stay at home, the government decided to, you know, loosen up a little bit restriction on the um, media that they have been enforced for many years. So during that window of, I would say, two to three weeks, so we've seen numerous of Chinese reporting that came out within China from the outlets that are in, published in China, which is required you have to be, um, you know, uh, registered with the government and they could have could take in your registration right away, basically, anytime if they're not really happy with your reporting or um, reinforce um, the, um, I would say they have a very huge impact on any kind of publications within China um, to allow you public publish or not. So um, within that three weeks of window, I would say I've seen Chinese journalism like just popped up everywhere that is in a way that I've never seen this ever since I studied journalism in China um, for like, this is the best like three weeks I've ever read in Chinese report um, in a decade. I would definitely say that. And um, um, lots of, um, the sad thing about it is like, after, you know, how many years of the uh, like tight control of journalism uh, and public opinion, Lots of good journalists have, I know, I've known like for years that have already left the industry. So um, lots of people might think like there's just no journalism in China anymore. There's no good journalists in China. But within that three weeks of period, we, we've seen the Chinese journalists really, um, you know, um, game up for this. They really show their capability of delivering information, investigation, and um, just provide the, the, I would say the best uh, quality of journalism um, that I wished I could have in China, like when I was a journalist there. So um, that period we've seen uh, not only like, not, not really local journalism because like a local journalists who probably um, in a Chinese uh, propaganda system that they are, um, local journalism are more controlled by the local government. But you, we've seen national level um, magazines, um, like, you know, um, investigative reporting, journalists that really went in to find information there through um, their local network and through, um, you know, crowdsourcing uh, journalism and um, really got a lot out of them from it. And even we've also seen citizen journalists um, when in Wuhan, and did a tons of good reporting during the lockdown, um, including one of them um, currently missing. And uh, um, I'm sure she, they, they are. All, uh, I think he's also on CPJ's uh, um, top list uh, right now, uh, Chen Chouxi. And um, like lots of those things came out in that three, two to three weeks period of time. And that was, um, you know, I would say that's probably the best journalism I've seen in China. Well. Well, so um, coronavirus now, like SARS back in 2002, was it, uh, is once again being described as China's Chernobyl. Um, so do you think that this is going to become any, is this going to turn into a crisis of legitimacy for the Chinese government? Has the sort of opening of journalism, even for this limited amount of time, do you think journalists will be able to keep pushing or will the government be able to keep uh, their sort of tight grip on repression and control, especially after some of the surveillance measures that they implemented to help track the spread of the virus and, you know, obviously by, by uh, tracking people. Yeah, um, I would say um, for sure that um, now people can relate to the uh, coronavirus um, more. And so they are calling this as the China's turnover moment more than what they call SARS right now. Um, and I think 
with SARS, a lot of information are still not being shared um, with the public until this day in China. Um, and it was 2003, so that's you know, 17, 18 years ago. Um, but sadly, we were seeing that that kind of information just like kind of just disappeared and no one remembers. <laughs> um, for a lot of people, especially younger generation, because they probably experienced the SARS in a very different way compared with this one. Um, and I've definitely see, have seen, you know, um, the current, uh, with the current, you know, that new HBO show, which is like a way for Chinese um, inside of the Great Fire War, they can um, access the show in a different way compared with the American audience. But um, it's one of the highest rating shows on one the Chinese like um, film website. So it's, um, a lot of people can relate the Chernobyl moment to like the COVID-19 moment together um, because of the both things happened, you know, the show and the, the current event happened so closely with each other. Um, so yeah, I, I would say um, like now more and more our people are actually actively talking about Chernobyl on Chinese social media and connect that with the uh, coronavirus events. Um, but unfortunately that's only one like very small group of Chinese because China is just a huge country. And with the with the government propaganda machine and a lot of online campaigns, um, you can definitely see even though um, there are a very small group of people can recognize this and see the government um, is trying to control the voice and also trying to shift the public opinion after um, they're currently opening up the country. Um, but at the same time, like um, that's just the tiny bit of Chinese uh, I'm talking about. Majority of the Chinese still kept in dark because of um, the, that's the only kind of information they can access, which is through the official um, channels. Right. Well, so uh, Courtney, um, you've been more focused on the Middle East. I mean, you're you're looking uh, with CPJ globally at uh, at the situation that journalists are facing. But I think you started your journalism career in Lebanon at a time when there weren't a lot of international journalists. And Lebanon, like many other Middle Eastern countries, is a challenge for journalists to report on, uh, to report from. And um, you know, the coronavirus then becomes obviously no exception, but presents uh, its own hurdles. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what it's like uh, for journalists in the Middle East right now. Sure, thanks so much. Um, I think that what we've seen similar to um, China and Russia is the Middle East is one of the most difficult places to work mm -hmm. as, a, as a journalist. And um, this has been the case for many years. Lebanon is, is a small bright spot. Um, I also worked in Dubai, which is not so much of a bright spot. Um, and, and Egypt, but unfortunately the Middle East is one of the most sensorial places in the world. If you kind of look at the range of repression from the killing of journalists, imprisonment of journalists, censorship, surveillance, um, attacks, restrictive legal environment, I mean, you name it, and they have the ignoble, you know, um, honor of being at the, at the, you know, worst of the worst list. Um, of course, this includes Iran as well which was also early on one of the epicenters um, of the coronavirus outbreak. And I think that one of the things we see um, throughout the Middle East, but also globally, is this effort by authorities to control information. And that really strikes me as, you know, the similarities when you were talking about, you know, Chernobyl, um, you know, having just finished the series recently, uh, as well as in China, you know, for many years has been this effort to control information, to um, control those who have access to information, and if they do have information, what information gets out. And it's been interesting to watch how fake news laws, you know, so-called fake news laws, um, which really gained steam after 2016 with the elevation of fake news to a rhetorical um, ploy by President Trump and has been echoed and, and reverberated around the world and picked up by many world leaders, authoritarian and democratic alike. We have seen now that the shift in the use of fake news to delegitimize reporting and to restrict journalism and even criminalize journalism. So throughout the Middle East, we see that the use of fake news laws are being used to intimidate 
uh, threaten and arrest journalists. We're also seeing this in, in parts of Africa, in, uh, in Europe, for example, in Hungary, uh, in Latin America. So really this is now a global pandemic. And we heard the World Health Organization, the head of the World Health Organization call coronavirus an infodemic. And one way to look at that is also the, the attempts to restrict and control information. And so obviously we saw this really start in China where they have one of the most sophisticated sensorial apparatus. And um, we've been tracking not only the crackdown on the local press there, which is obviously extensive, but I think I would, it, it's been really awesome to watch, as Jin said, this amazing journalism coming out of China. And we know that there's local journalism because uh, China constantly ranks at the top of our imprisoned journalist list, the, the countries that imprison the most journalists. It's either Turkey or China year on year, they're kind of vying for top, um, top honor there. And so there must be people doing journalism, right? And so we've seen that ongoing crackdown, we've seen them kick out foreign correspondents. Um, but now we've seen in Egypt and in Iraq that they've taken the same steps. So Egypt threw out a foreign correspondent for the Guardian and Iraq pulled the license for Reuters after they reported statistics on coronavirus that did not match the official version of uh, corona, you know, coronavirus statistics. Um, so these restrictions on who you can talk to, what you're allowed to report in terms of official versus non-official statistics, this effort to um, constrict the spread of disinformation being used as a cover for restricting independent and often critical journalism. Um, and in, in several places, including for, ex Iran, for example, in Iran um, and Egypt, the actual arrest of journalists as we're seeing in China as well. Um, all of which is creating really perilous conditions in countries that don't have uh, rule of law, democratic norms, because we depend on journalists in those countries to give us alternative uh, information to that of, of officials who you know, we can't necessarily trust. So it's you know, continuing to be incredibly challenging to be a journalist in the Middle East. Nonetheless, as in China, you know, as in Russia, even after colleagues are murdered and arrested and threatened, they somehow keep uh, keep up doing their job and, and we're there behind them. Yeah, I mean, it's as challenging as the circumstances get with sort of online networks and uh, organizations or alliances that exist, you know, there are far more resources for journalists to turn to each other to try to, to work around these, these barriers. Is there anything that more that you can say about how journalists are working together to overcome these, uh, these hurdles? Sure. So one of the things that's really impacting journalists are these quarantine and stay at home requirements. And in most countries, journalists are exempt from them. But one thing we've seen is that freelancers are being really hard hit by these because they don't necessarily have an official press card or maybe, you know, the government syndicate or press authority wouldn't give them a press card because they're not in the good graces of the government because they're reporting critically. So it's having a huge impact on the news industry writ large, but particularly freelancers. So we have seen the community mobilize with emergency support funds. Um, International Women's Media Foundation has one, as do, uh, as do many other organizations, including CPJ. We have our emergency assistance fund, you know, trying to support um, the safe reporting and just the livelihoods of many of these reporters. Um, we're also seeing a lot of safety, uh, attention to safety. Um, this is an unprecedented type of pandemic. And I think there is an kind of this assumption that maybe if you're a journalist who's reported in a dangerous situation before, like in a conflict zone, that that somehow means that you know how to report on a health pandemic. And those are very different. And so there's a lot of learning that needs to be done. Um, we've created a safety resource on how to report safely on Corona that has been translated into, I think, almost 40 languages on our website, um, cpj.org backslash COVID-19. So we're trying to put out those resources um, to help reporters do that safely. We see the community has really rallied very quickly to do that. So there are a lot of webinars, um, toolkits, et cetera. 
What else, but the other issue we're seeing is we have to get out ahead of some of the press freedom threats. So I want to mention the Free the Press campaign that we're running, and I'm going to um, post a link to the petition that you can sign because what we're seeing is, A, there were already 250 journalists behind bars for doing their job according to our last prison census, and with more journalists being um, detained and put in prison or not having access to the justice system and their trials being put on hold because of coronavirus, in prison, you cannot social distance, you can't practice good hygiene, so it could amount to a death sentence. So we are trying to get all of the journalists in jail out of prison. So I'm sharing the link right now in the chat, change.org backslash free the press, please sign it. It's really critical that we come to support our colleagues who are behind bars. Also, you know, we're seeing that um, this is going to have a long-term implication for the press, both in terms of sustainability. Um, right now, we are hearing from reporters, especially freelancers, that you know there, there are no stories other than coronavirus. And so if you cover any other issue, you either have to find a way to link it to coronavirus or you know, you're, you're out of a news hole, you're out of an assignment. Um, so we have to think about that. And we need to think about the long-term implications of the surveillance regimes that are being set up ostensibly under um, health, you know, to, to monitor health and, and do contact tracing, but which in many countries don't have the safeguards in place and the limitations in place to prevent them from being misused after the fact. And we know this is an issue, especially for journalists, because after 9-11, you know, after the terror attacks of 9-11 and the war on terror, we saw this massive expansion of the use of terrorism charges and surveillance to target journalists and to put journalists in prison on terrorism charges and to surveil them. Um, and of course, we know about the mass surveillance that took place um, because that Snowden revealed. So we need to be very careful that these potentially very legitimate surveillance regimes that we're putting together to you know, prevent a virus from spreading aren't then used to target you know, reporters who reported against, you know, about government ineptitude or whatever it is. And it might sound a little far-fetched, but if history is going to be a guide, we know that it's not. Yeah. Um, on that note, uh, this is a question for, for you, Jen. Uh, at AJ Plus, where I, I work as an editor, we just put out a video looking at the differences in response between the US and South Korea and uh, some of the geo-tracking measures that South Korea was using to implement contact tracing. And one of the women that we interviewed about this uh, was saying that those types of surveillance measures would have uh, a harder time being accepted here in the US because of our discourse around civil liberties, which I'm not sure is actually necessarily the case given what Courtney just said about the entire surveillance regime that was uh, implemented after 9-11. Um, but I think, you know, I'm wondering uh, from your perspective of uh, going through SARS in 2002, uh, your experience of the public adapting to government mandated rules or uh, changing norms in order to prepare uh, to prepare for future pandemics or to c continue um, living with with a with a current outbreak. Yeah, I think uh, for Chinese it's very different because we do um, kind of like grow up and live in a surveillance state. So when we are looking at those methods that like, you know, we, we can't live, live in China without WeChat, literally, because um, that's like an app that look like, you know, Facebook plus um, WhatsApp uh, plus several other social media platforms all together. But at the same time, it's also the basically the mobile paying system. And in China, pretty much you're now cash free. You go everywhere, scan a QR code and you give up your information at, at like to anybody, literally. So um, for Chinese, I think the privacy of your data is not as like um, prioritized as for Americans. Um, so um, for lots of people, they just, you know, um, like willingly or unwillingly giving out their data all the time to the government in many ways, um, like throughout the day. So for this one, like China now is implementing the, the health code, which means like you have to have this, like you have to register, you have to um, using this for your future doctor appointment and all the, all the doctors you will be seeing are in public ho uh, uh, hospitals, which is super easy to giving out information like a little by little, a bit by bit every single day. And that's 
um, like for us, it's very dangerous as journalists that you know that uh, the huge amount of data um, like they are um, holding from um, the, uh, from like e either like civilians or just uh, from um, the um, like people you're interviewing and all those things that all come together. Um, at, at the government's hand. And digital security is really not something that Chinese journalists have any, you know, understanding or like uh, um, have any um, like training on because that's not part of our journalism training at all. Not even here in the US, how would that be in China? So I think like that's a part of the problem we're seeing right now is because of COVID-19, you're giving out a lot of more information of how you move from city to city, from this, this part to that part. In China, there were a time that in, on the public transportation, you can, it's not required and mandated, but you can scan a code and tell people, you tell the government that you've been on this cart in this subway. So it helps them to track cases for sure, but at the same, for COVID-19 for sure. But at the same time, like uh, this is basically you're willingly giving out information of how you move every day uh, from there to uh, this point to another point. So if they continue using that information from you, using your WeChat data, um, that's just gonna create much bigger problem down the road. And we don't know the, whether or not the government is gonna use this information in other ways. Um, and I could say for if they, you are a journal, working journalist in China um, and you are writing, you know, investigative reporting or uh, things that the government not necessarily like you about uh, writing, and those are the things that just are gonna trigger a lot of things down the road that we cannot predict. And I think Courtney definitely agree with me that the more information you give out to the government, the more danger you are putting yourself in as a journalist in China. Yeah, and then I have uh, one last question, which uh, any three of you can answer or jump in on, and then we'll uh, take questions from the chat. Uh, but basically, it seems like where we are in the news coverage of coronavirus at this time, as we're passing the peak, at least in New York City, and we're getting used to, to sort of to living with this and reporting on this a, a little bit more, it seems that some of the attention is now around really establishing uh, accurate figures. Here in the U.S., getting more accurate death toll from China, Iran, we also don't have, we, we can't trust that information as much. And a lot of this will fall to journalists in terms of their relationships with the medical community and with doctors and nurses and other frontline workers. Um, and those will continue to be, you know, essential relationships and sources that journalists have. Um, I mean, for, for a long time, as they continue to report on this and try to establish the truth and the narrative around coronavirus. So I'm curious um, with your different experiences, you know, how you think this will fare and how journalists will adapt under these circumstances to try to continue to establish the, the truth of coronavirus. Uh, I mean, I think that we see journalists doing a tremendous and very difficult job. So first of all, you know, continuing to go out on the front lines, um, you know, photographers and video journalists, they can't work from behind a desk. Print journalists are in a little bit of a better shape, but they've also got to be thinking about their digital security as they're communicating with sources, trying to track down information. It's also really challenging because um, many governments have put restrictions on freedom of information requests and, and access information, including our own, um, where you have the, the FBI, for, for example, have put on these restrictions where now you can only get information in person requests, which makes no sense. So, you know, but nonetheless, we see reporters continuing to really try to do it a really good job, but it's very challenging when you've got presidents like Trump, Bolsonaro, Dut sorry, Bols President Bolsonaro in Brazil, Duterte in the Philippines, who are also giving inaccurate information, misconstruing expert advice and causing a really challenging reporting environment because reporters now have to help and figure out how to navigate, uh, you know, what is the truth? And also this is, as it's called the novel coronavirus. So it's not 100% clear that what we believe is a fact today will continue as you know, as things progress, as dynamics change, as we get a better understanding of what the denominator is in all of this, that that's gonna be the case anymore. And so I think 
reporters are in a really difficult position because there's been a decline in trust uh, among media around the world over the past several years in most regions, not all, but in most. Um, but interestingly, I think we have seen that there is now an increase in people searching out uh, established news organizations. And so maybe there is this ultimate like reconciling with the fact that like we, we do have institutions like the press, um, which are playing this really important role in the information environment. But I think it's a very challenging situation for reporters that are trying to report accurately, but it's not necessarily clear what that means. I absolutely agree with uh, Corny on that. Um, I just still want to add that um, journalists are facing challenges, not only like how they can do their work during this time, but also how their work being like spread and read online, because that's the way how people access information. And then we, we have seen like the increasing, you know, uh, attacks on journalists uh, of like whether or not the, the, the information they've been shared, they're sharing are like um, fake or they are um, actually the data that same as the government. So we definitely have seen that. In China, if you are publishing data that is not released by the government, you are default into the fake news law category that you will be punished right away. Um, so like those kind of things that are just really tricky, both on the um, side with the government, uh, challenging the government, doing their job at this time. At the same time, they also face backlashes once they release a, a different information uh, or like a really something that people don't necessarily like. I think uh, taking it a little different, I totally agree with all those. With something Courtney said earlier though, that I think um, we aren't talking about as much, but I think we should be, is she, she compared after 9-11 how um, there was only one story. And I remember I was in Ukraine at the time and a lot of people who were reporting overseas, Americans reporting overseas left and came back to the US at that time because you couldn't sell stories from, uh, any story you had to sell had to be about the war on terror. You couldn't sell a different kind of story. And while this was a worldwide pandemic, I'm seeing that same insular turning in of countries um, where we're just uh, reporting one story and we're reporting it very much from one perspective. And I think we're losing again, um, a lot of other stories out there and larger issues. And I find that really scary because after September 11th, it, there was um, a lot of news that was missed. And I know a lot of organizations, I think, um, uh, came up after that time. I didn't believe left, was it soon after September? A lot of organizations to try and help journalists tell more of a full picture and support because we had a lot of that there. Um, and uh, so I just hope we don't lose track of the other stories as well. Well, this is a really important story that we um, still keep telling other stories and allow journalists to tell them and also um, widen our perspective so we don't turn in like we did after September 11th. I'll take, there are a couple questions in the chat, so I'll turn to those very quickly. Uh, so Stephanie from Facebook asked, can you describe how Chinese journalists before COVID-19 may have had to self-censure or how they determined what information would be dangerous to investigate? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, basically, if you are familiar or not familiar with the Chinese um, system of publishing, um, majority of the media are controlled by the state or owned by the state. Um, and then in that way, the state government do have, a, or like a, at local levels, um, at provincial level and central level, they have different tiers of uh, breakdowns of how they control uh, different kind of publications. Um, so as a journalist, the most of the time, I trust my instinct on whether or not this is something I should be reporting on. There is always, a, we call it a red line, but it's a floating red line. It shifts from left to right. It can be here today, tomorrow, there. Um, it can, we can write some reporting come out like uh, this month and next month might be uh, not okay. Um, so it really depends on like a journalist and their editors um, expertise and years of experience of um, being a news consumer at the same time being a news creator. Um, so um, there are also obviously there are um, like a very direct, um, I would say um, orders from 
the government level officials that um, goes directly uh, to the editor in chief um, of the publication, usually um, for traditional media and for the website side, um, you know, you just you just know you, you post something and it getting deleted right away. And it not, might not even be news you publish today. It might be something you published three three months ago. And uh, one day they decided, OK, this word is a censor word. Were well, they going to delete everything that has this censor word? Um, on the internet in the past how many how many months and then they just wipe out your publishing history um, that's also uh, possible so I would say um, yeah self censor is definitely part of the journalism life there a lot of journalists that I know um, they do um, self censoring but at the same time they try their best within the limit um, of the government to, to really uh, push the limit to the extreme to write write um, stories in a different way or like a, approach it with a different angle, but still achieve the mission of getting the word out. Um, so yeah, uh, that's pretty much my answer to that question. Sorry, uh, then another question. Uh, so someone on Facebook is wondering what you all think about how Trump is denigrating journalists, especially women and people of color, and that it just continues to get worse. Uh, so maybe Courtney, if you want to take this first, since uh, CBJ released a report about Trump and the media last week. Yeah, so we um, did a report looking at uh, the Trump and his relationship with the media and the press, the way we did um, under Obama as well. We did a report on Obama administration, the press, and uh, what we found was not shocking, although when you kind of put it all together, it is really sad. We have found that the attacks on journalists, uh, on individual journalists, on media outlets, and on the very concept and profession of journalism have continued. I think last week or the week before, he sent his 2000th tweet uh, denigrating or pillaring the media in some way. Uh, my, my former colleague keeps track of that with the US Press Freedom Tracker. Um, and the so the rhetorical uh, attacks on the press, which often happen online, have real world consequences in terms of leading to increased threats against women journalists and journalists of color, which have also translated into physical incidents. It leads to increased insecurity at um, public events such as rallies or potentially the conventions. We actually had a big project plan this year to go to both of the conventions as well as rallies um, to help journalists stay safe on the ground, understand, you know, what were they doing to keep safe because we are worried, you know, you see attacks, um, these attacks have an impact on public opinion and thinking that it's okay to attack journalists. We've also seen that attacks on media owners and kind of the financial independence of the media, these threats to um, open up libel laws, et cetera. Um, but overwhelmingly, you know, especially even just in the past several weeks with the coronavirus coverage, it does seem that a lot of his attacks on journalists who ask him difficult questions um, end up denigrating those journalists, and a lot of them are women. He attacks these women, um, and that has a real impact on the their ability to do their jobs, first of all, but also, of course, um, on you know their psychosocial state. Uh, it's it's not easy. We feel we hear from journalists how challenging it is reporting on this administration, but at the same time, we also I have heard how they understand, especially with coronavirus now again, how important journalism is, not only to a democracy, but also to um, addressing public health concerns. I just want to add that to Trump's uh, attack on Asian American journalists and Asian journalists at this specific time really is putting our colleagues at a Asian American Journalism Associations and uh, um, Chinese colleagues who are reporting in America in danger um, and it's, um, I would say like, like, like last week or um, she, he just uh, asked this CBS journalist, the Wei Jiajian, where do, where do you work for? Like, and after she said CBS, it's kind of ironic that she, he literally uh, racially uh, pro, uh, profiled her and as thinking she is someone working for Chinese media or like Asian media, um, just because she look Asian. And that's um, something that 
um, within the Asian American journalism community that created a lot of tension and a lot of, you know, um, anxiety of how our work are going to be after this and how are we going to um, report in uh, the environment that we don't even know whether or not that's going to be safe for ourselves just being there. And that is on the top of her, uh, the, the his, uh, Trump's attack on women journalists and just the, on women of color in general. Um, yeah, I think the only thing I'll just add to that is, I mean, these attacks are, are nothing new, but it's, it's very important in this environment to support in particular women and people of color journalists because a lot of the burden of COVID-19 are falling on those communities in particular. So obviously we can see the racial disparities within the data about coronavirus deaths, but then also in quarantine, there, there are issues for um, survivors of domestic violence and uh, you know, other issues are with domestic workers, you know, uh, being turned away and losing their work at this particular time. So it's it's important as well to support uh, journalists who have relationships and sources within those communities, and to try to give them the support and opportunities to still do that reporting. In some ways, again, to counter some of the um, the focus from media on sort of coronavirus just as a whole, or on Trump, and make sure that some of those other stories from marginalized communities. Uh, you know, still still make it out there. Um, and yeah, are there any other concluding thought uh, concluding thoughts? Okay. Well, then I think we'll wrap it up there. And thank you, everyone, for joining. And uh, again, to LA Public Library for uh, hosting this. There's something on chat. Yeah, everyone should read uh, Katya's uh, book. <laughs> oh, thanks. No, no, there's something else too, though. <laughs> there's um, someone was saying this time many journalists are taking a bite of all. You did. Oh, it was just a thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought it was a question. So, no, no, no. well, we, we thank you very much for joining us. And yes, please do uh, check out Katya's book and do uh, look at the resources that Courtney posted in the chat about CPJ and the petitions to help support journalists right now. And yeah, thank you for joining us. Stay safe, stay distant. I just thought I'd pop back on to, to thank you all again and make sure to check out LAPL.org. Um, and please ask your librarians any questions you have about getting more material, getting access to databases for more information, getting access to books that were mentioned. So thank you all for coming and we'll hopefully see you soon. <laughs>